first of all, warm congratulations to the SSM. I mean, at least I see many, many colleagues here from the SSM for the anniversary. I don't think uh, a lot of people thought there would be an SSM today, but there is, and it's uh, growing and alive and kicking and doing extremely well. Um, I just regret we are still in two different buildings, but that's for obvious reasons. So, um, um, Rafa is, of course, someone who does not need introduction, but actually I do want to say a few things because it's my real pleasure to be able to introduce him uh, to you. Um, I think he's, uh, of course, known as one of the great um, economic scholars here in Europe for many decades, but I would actually want to emphasize his role in um, building up SEMFI, uh, the director of SEMFI for many, many years. And indeed, many of the colleagues here have been students of him and the colleagues over there. And um, nowadays, I, I sometimes feel, at least in the US, there's too much emphasis on research and not enough on education. And um, definitely, SEMFI is an, an exception in that regard, combining both very successfully, and I think is a great initiative. I, I wish all countries in Europe had a similar setup. Um, very close cooperation with the central bank indeed. Um, we also had um, a while back the pleasure of hosting Rafa as a Wim Duesenberg fellow here at the ECB. And we had many interesting conversations, including on the topic that you will talk about today, uh, which is very dear to my heart as well. I think we share some common research interest in this area. So with that, um, the floor is all yours. You have an hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, uh, well, this uh, paper wouldn't exist if uh, Andreas didn't invite me. So I think that uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to complete some uh, proposal that I started as a Dysonberg Fellow. So this was the idea that I had many years ago. And in the end, uh, I didn't succeed, but hopefully this time round uh, it will be, it will be successful. Okay, I would like to start with uh, a few remarks that connect with what uh, Claudia Buch said yesterday in her opening remarks. Now the um, okay, so so in particular, I would like to um, note that uh, until the global financial crisis, uh, academics paid little attention to bank regulation and supervision. And um, in particular, bank regulation was isolated from mainstream economics and bank supervision was even more isolated. So the, uh, I can add that uh, many, mainly US academics, uh, confuse regulation with supervision. So I want to cite this paper by Agarval um, et al. in the QJE. Uh, the title was Inconsistent Regulators, but of course they were talking about uh, uh, federal and state supervisors. And actually, Joao Granja yesterday mentioned this uh, John Cochran's uh, article that was about uh, where were the regulators. And in fact, uh, he was not talking about regulation, he was talking about supervision. Anyway, so um, it is also the case that supervisors had little interest in interacting with researchers just inside or outside central banks, uh, and partly because of this reluctance to share supervisory information. But things have changed. And let me mention possible drivers of change. I mean, the use of stress testing in banking supervision is an important, uh, significant change. The arrival of this new area of macro pro uh, is also important. But I would also like to say, especially in this building, that the appointment of researchers to top positions in supervision is also important. And I think that this is something that should be uh, stressed. Um, now there are many academics on uh, academic papers on bank supervision. There are some research conferences like this one, and uh, let me say that I've been extremely pleased with the quality of the papers that I have seen in this conference. So congratulations. Uh, um, so, but let me add that almost all the research uh, on bank supervision that I have seen is empirical. So there are a number of facts that uh, lack a theoretical explanation. Uh, Claudia yesterday was uh, um, sort of asking for a conceptual framework anyway. So since I'm a theorist, uh, what I'm going to do is to try to uh, set up a model that uh, uh, tries to sort of provide a, uh, some kind of uh, uh, mechanisms behind some of these uh, facts that have been uh, 
uh, obtaining this empirical uh, literature. Let me just mention a few papers just to uh, sort of uh, tell you what uh, has been done. I mean, this, uh, the paper that I mentioned before uh, in the QJ 2014 were basically looking at the comparison between federal and state supervisors and basically showing that the leniency of state supervisors uh, led to higher failure rates. There is this uh, paper by people from the New York Feb, uh, and then basically what they conclude is that bank supervision lowers risk taking the quantity of supervision. Uh, the paper by uh, Joao and co-authors uh, is about uh, uh, role of supervisors in enforcing report transparency. And this is something that I will say something at the end uh, of my talk. Another paper that uh, shows that uh, Following a, a natural experiment in a decline of supervisory oversight, there is a causal effect uh, involving high risk taking. Uh, the famous Eisenbach, Luck, and Townsend paper uh, presents a structural model of allocation of supervisory hour, and, and, and they find a significant effect of supervision on bank risk. And they note the following I'm copying from that paper. In estimating the effect of supervision on bank risk, we do not explicitly specify the channel through which supervision operates. So basically, this is what I'm trying to uh, do in this, in this paper. Now, there are uh, uh, many papers with uh, European data. This is about the uh, effect of the asset quality review. This is another one that uh, has to do with the effect on the uh, stress tests uh, uh, that uh, shows also reductions in uh, credit risk. Another paper by Diana and co-authors uh, about uh, the role of uh, on-site inspections in Portugal uh, that uh, reduce zombie lending. Uh, the paper that uh, we saw yesterday presented by Miguel, uh, in which they uh, show using the credit register that supranational supervision reduces credit supply to riskier mm -hmm. firms. And the paper that uh, was uh, was presented, actually, uh, uh, Cedric, I'm sorry, your your name was uh, uh, deleted from here. The, the, I, I had a I had a, a, a revised slide. So this is the the one that I didn't. Uh, anyway, so so it was about subtech uh, in in Brazil. Anyway, so what I do in in this paper is to um, present. Uh, a model uh, of the effect of supervision on bank risk taking, I want to think about the interaction between supervision and regulation and uh, try to uh, answer the question, are they complements or substitutes? Now, the, just to give you an overview of the model, I consider two agents, a bank and a supervisor, three days, zero, one, and two. At t equals zero, the bank is going to raise one unit of insured deposits and is going to choose the unobservable risk of the investment. At t equals one, the supervisor is going to get a signal on the return of the investment and is going to assess whether the bank is failing or likely to fail. And if it is so, then it is going to close the bank or I will say something about uh, the resolution authority at the very end of my talk. And finally, at t equals two, if the bank is not close at t equals one, there's going to be some final return realized. Okay, what do I show in this uh, paper? Well, in laissez-faire, i.e. without regulation and supervision, the bank has an incentive to take excessive risk. Well, not very surprising. I also show that regulation in the form of capital requirements reduces risk taking, and I show that supervision also reduces risk taking, but with an interesting and perhaps a bit surprising result. The disciplining effects of supervision come from the fact that supervisory information is noisy. So in here, noise is a good thing. And that's something that I will try to sort of explain uh, as I go along. Now, so this is what is in the paper. I set up the model. I discuss first, let's say, fair situation. Then I do first regulation, then supervision, then put the two things together. I have a few slides on discussing the results, and then I will conclude. So that's the plan for the talk. The model set up. Now, um, as I said, there are three dates, zero, one, and two. It's a risk neutral bank and a supervisor. The bank raises one unit of deposits at t equals zero and is going to invest these funds in an asset with returns uh, which could be at t equals one if there is liquidation and that's called L and or at t equals two if there is no liquidation and then this is what produces R. Now, uh, the assumptions that I'm going to make is that deposits are insured and the deposit rate is normalized to zero. 
and that uh, asset returns are normally distributed. Uh, and this is obviously something that uh, for tractability is not a very realistic assumption, but I think that, as you will see, it produces some very nice uh, closed form solutions. So the, in the, there's a normal distribution for both L and R, and I will explain in a minute the different parameters, A, B, C, that appear in this uh, uh, expression now. Um, the first assumption is that the expected value of R, uh, which is R bar, is greater than one. So the expected final return is greater than the face value of the deposit. So which this means is that this is a positive MPV investment. The second assumption is that the expected liquidation return uh, is A R bar is smaller than R bar. So the expected liquidation return is smaller than the expected final return. And so therefore, what you have from here is that in the absence of any information, and we are going to have supervisory information, liquidation is inefficient. You wouldn't do that, okay? But that was obviously their role for uh, supervisory information. The third assumption that I want to make is that there is a positive correlation between L and R. So the liquidation return and the final return are positively correlated. And I think that this is important when you think about uh, uh, banks investing in financial assets, uh, not real assets that could be redeployed to other sectors at a price that is independent of, of R. Finally, uh, I am assuming this is not strictly needed, that the variance of L is smaller than the variance of R. Uh, I think that the passage of time uh, probably opens up uh, volatility, and so this, this also implies that uh, since the variance covariance matrix has to be positive definite, the C parameter that appears in the, um, in the corners uh, is smaller than one. So these are the assumptions that I'm making on the probability distribution of uh, liquidation and final return. So bank risk taking, the bank is going to choose the risk of its investment, uh, sigma, at t equals zero. And I'm going to assume that deriving from a reference value sigma bar, which is positive, entails a cost. Uh, and I'm going to assume that this cost is quadratic. So in a way, this sigma bar characterizes the business model of the bank. If you deviate from the business model, then this is something that is costly, right? So that's uh, uh, deviating in either direction by making more risk or less risk. So, and, 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 and this is a key assumption of the model, and the, the purpose is to concavify the objective function of the bank and to allow us for, to get uh, interior solutions to the bank's uh, problem. So that's, uh, okay, so this is the description of, of the model, so let me move on to the laissez-faire uh, uh, analysis. Now, in the absence of regulation or supervision, the bank is going to maximize the expected payoff at t equals two, which is denoted by this uh, pi of sigma, net of the cost of risk taking, which is this quadratic cost, which also depends on sigma. Now, the uh, bank's choice of risk is obviously the value of sigma that maximizes this uh, objective function, which is the difference between the pi and the c. Uh, the bank's expected payoff at t equals two has these two uh, components. Uh, one is uh, the expected uh, value of the max r minus one. This is the typical equity payoff, one, remember, is the face value of the debt, and that has to be multiplied by the probability that this R is greater than or equal to one. Now, uh, the, by the properties of normal distributions, we can actually compute this uh, conditional, this expectation of the max function, and has uh, this form where, and you can also compute the probability that you will exceed uh, this uh, face value of the dead one, which is just little phi is the, CD, the probability density function, capital phi is the, is the cumulative uh, distribution function of a standard normal random variable. If you put the two things together, then you get the bank's expected payoff RT equals two, which has this sort of uh, nice uh, formula. Now, it's important to note that uh, in this context, the bank's uh, objective function uh, is convex uh, because it's, it's sort of this uh, equity uh, payoff. And by uh, these well-known results of second-order stochastic dominance, the bank would like to choose a large amount of risk, in fact, an infinite amount of risk. If you differentiate this objective function with respect to sigma, what you're going to get is that any additional amount of risk is going to increase the bank's expected payoff, right? So risk-taking is good. Okay, so, uh, and that's where uh, the uh, cost of uh, risk-taking, the 
C of sigma ensures an interior solution. So that's, that's why, and I think that this is a fairly realistic assumption. So um, the bank's choice of risk is characterized by the first order condition where you differentiate the two components. This is the derivative of the pi. This is the derivative of the quadratic function that I uh, mentioned before. And notice that the value of a density function is a positive. So if the sum of these two things is going to be equal to zero, then obviously the second term is going to be negative. So therefore, sigma is going to be the choice of uh, the bank is going to be greater than sigma bar. So the bank is going to uh, increase the asset risk above the reference value sigma bar. Okay, so let me show you a picture. Um, so, so there's going to be a positive cost of uh, excess risk taking. Now let me show you a picture that illustrates these two functions. The dash blue line is the uh, expected payoff, which is increasing in sigma. But once you subtract the cost of risk taking, then you have the solid blue line. And you can see that uh, the sigma star is the maximum here. It is to the right of sigma bar. So this is the excess uh, risk taking that you have uh, in laissez-faire, right? So the question now is, well, what happens if we, uh, if we uh, introduce regulation in the form of capital requirements and supervision in a way that I will explain when I get there? Now, one sort of uh, side uh, comment that one can make, sorry, two, two things, and something about parameter values. I mean, I, there is no mystery. I mean, I, I choose round numbers for the uh, illustration of this, uh, of this model. Uh, it is important to note that uh, the parameter values that I have chosen are not intended to provide, sorry, a calibration of, uh, of the model. Uh, they are chosen to facilitate the graphical representation of the qualitative results. So don't look at the vertical axis. I mean, the numbers mean nothing, although I'm going to tell you something about some of these numbers towards the end of my talk. Okay. So um, one thing that one can do with this uh, model and the laissez-faire is to look at uh, what would happen if we increase the bank's market power. In particular, remember that, that the R bar is the expected uh, payoff of the investment. So you can differentiate the first order condition and uh, that I derived before. And then uh, by the second order condition, the denominator is going to be negative. R bar minus one greater than zero means that the derivative of the density function is going to be in the downward sloping part. So therefore the numerator is negative, 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 negative. We have a negative effect. So higher market power reduces bank risk taking, which is in line with the classical charter value of you. So this is, uh, this is I mean, the model is, is sort of conventional on that, uh, on that part. Okay, so let me uh, now move to introduce bank capital regulation. Um, I want to uh, examine the effect of a regulation that requires the bank to fund a fraction K bar of its uh, unit investment with equity capital. The um, uh, capital, I'm going to assume, as it is uh, done in most of these papers, that is more expensive than insured deposits, and delta is going to denote the excess cost of uh, bank capital. Now, if you uh, modify the bank's objective function to uh, take into account of capital, there are two things that you should note first. Now, the uh, value of the liabilities is not one, it's just one minus K, because uh, a fraction K is funded with equity capital. And uh, so that's, uh, so this is the bank recipe point, it's just going to be one minus K. And then of course you have to subtract the cost of equity capital and delta is the excess cost of, of capital. Now um, I'm assuming that uh, the amount of capital that the bank uh, decides to chooses to uh, have uh, could be higher than the K bar, uh, which was, uh, uh, is, is the capital requirement, right? Um, so, but this, I will show in a minute, is going to be suboptimal. So the capital requirement is going to be strictly binding in this model. No reason why the bank would want to have any kind of uh, capital buffer. Now, another way in which I could write the expected payoff would be if I divide by one plus delta, maybe this is an, kind of an easier uh, uh, expression. Uh, so the first term, which is the minus K that appear here, is the contribution of the bank shareholders at T equals zero. And then the second term is, is the discounted expected payoff at T equals zero. So that will be the bank's objective function written in an equivalent manner. So 
by our previous results on, on the computation of these uh, uh, expectations, then you can show that uh, the uh, expected payoff has this form. There is a part that has, is multiplied by the phi, the probability that you're going to uh, survive, and then there is a second term that depends on the CDF, and then, of course, you have to subtract the one minus delta K. Now, if you differentiate this objective function with respect to K, what you're going to get is the phi here, which is a number between zero and one, is smaller than one, minus something that is bigger than one. So it's smaller than zero. What this means is that the constraint will always be binding. The bank will always want to reduce its capital to a point in which you have uh, exactly the amount required by the regulation. Okay, now that we know that the bank uh, capital is going to be binding, the objective function is going to be just as before, the expected payoff minus the cost of restaking, and this would be the bank's choice of risk is the value that maximizes this expression. There is a first order condition, which basically tells you that this term is going to be positive, therefore that has to be negative, and again, we are going to have uh, an excess restaking, but uh, uh, let me show you, this is the uh, picture that we had uh, before. The blue is what we had before. This is the less affair. The green is what happens with capital requirements. The bank's objective function is pushed down because of the uh, uh, cost of, uh, of bank capital. But notice that there is this effect that the maximum uh, uh, value of the, uh, now the green line, it is to the left of uh, sigma star. So what, what this means is that capital requirements uh, are effective in reducing uh, uh, bank restaking. In fact, you can show this analytically. If you differentiate the first order condition, then what you can show is that uh, the higher capital requirements are going to reduce bank restaking. Again, nothing very surprising here. This is uh, all relatively uh, well known. Now, this is a picture that shows uh, uh, the bank's choice of risk as a function of the capital requirement. The corner there is the less fair. You can see that uh, uh, it is uh, decreasing. Perhaps uh, more interestingly, we could uh, uh, plot the probability of bank failure under regulation, and notice that here there are two effects. Uh, one effect goes because uh, uh, having uh, uh, the capital K bar sort of is, gives you a, a bigger buffer, uh, and then, of course, uh, there is the effect that goes through the fact that the bank is going to be taking less risk. So the combination of the, these two things uh, leads to a lower probability of bank failure, and, and this would be the picture. I, I mean, for some reason, it's almost linear function. As you can see, higher capital requirements reduces the probability of bank failure. Okay, so this is nothing really very new here. So let me now move to what is the core of my uh, paper, which is uh, the uh, modeling and analysis of bank supervision. Okay, so here, what I'm going to assume is that the supervisor observes at equals one a non-verifiable signal of the final return of the bank's investment. So the bank observes this uh, signal S, which is the return plus epsilon, where epsilon is a pure noise. Uh, it has a normal distribution with uh, variance uh, mean zero, variance tau sigma square, and it's going to be independent of both L and R. Now, notice that this is, I think, important. This is not a signal about the risk that the bank chose ex ante. This is not a signal about the sigma. It's a signal not about the action, but about the consequences of an action. So if the bank took a lot of risk and things are going wonderfully, then basically the signal is going to be good and no worries uh, there. It's about what happens. Uh, the signal is going to tell the supervisor that this uh, it's very low, that means that either R is low or maybe the noise uh, has been particularly low, but that's, that's the basic idea in this, in this uh, modeling. Now, um, so tau is going to characterize the noise in the supervisory information, and if you put together uh, all these uh, three random variables, then you're going to have this joint distribution of signals and returns, uh, and uh, let me just uh, make a couple of comments about that. Notice that the expected value of the signal is just the R bar because the expected value of the epsilon is zero and that the variance of the signal is the variance of the sum of these two random variables and it's going to give you the one plus tau sigma square that appears here. The covariance between R and S 
is just going to be equal to the variance of R, so therefore you have a one there, and the covariance between L, the liquidation value, and S is going to give you C times sigma squared. So these are the statistical uh, properties of this kind of uh, model. Now, um, by the properties of normal distributions, this is all very well known, you can compute the expected value of the liquidation return and the expected value of the continuation return, which are going to be functions uh, of the signal that you have here. Now notice that C is a parameter which is less than one. So the slope of the first one is smaller than the slope of the second. So um, a property that is kind of useful is that these expectations do not depend on the risk chosen by the bank. And so um, you, what you can do here, let me, let me skip this uh, and say that uh, uh, you can plot, let me do it, okay, here. You, you can plot this uh, expected value of uh, the final return conditional on S, I put plot S on the horizontal axis, and the expected value of the liquidation return conditional on S, and given the fact that the slope of the red line is smaller than the slope of the green line, there's going to be an intersection. So to the left of uh, what I denote S star, if liquidation would be efficient, to the right would be uh, inefficient. So, and I make the assumption that the uh, point of intersection is such that the bank is effectively bankrupt, so it's uh, below the uh, face value of, 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 of the debt. Okay, so that's, that defines S star, the efficient liquidation threshold. However, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to forget for a while that uh, this efficient liquidation uh, threshold, I'm going to assume that the supervisor uh, is not going to use that efficient liquidation threshold because what I want to uh, analyze is uh, the rule whereby the bank is going to take an action if it assesses that the bank is uh, failing or likely to fail. So this is the uh, SSM criterion. So, um, in uh, looking at the website, there are four reasons why a bank can be declared failing or likely to fail. Uh, this is, of course, something that is very well known to you. No longer fulfills requirements for authorization, more liabilities and assets, unable to pay its debts, requires extraordinary financial public support, and uh, at the time of declaring a bank failing or likely to fail, one of the above conditions must be met or likely to be met. So in particular, I want to focus on the second one. It has more liabilities than assets. And so what I want to look in terms of the closure rule is one in which, uh, well, the expected final return, which is the assets assessed after conditioning on the supervisor information are less than the liabilities, right? So that's the crit criterion that I'm going to use. And that's going to uh, define uh, the threshold S hat, which is the closure threshold used by my supervisor, okay? So that's the idea. Now, um, you, 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 you may want to compare uh, these, uh, and one nice thing again about this model is that this closure threshold doesn't depend on the risk chosen by the bank. It's something that, uh, and this is uh, possibly an artifact, but uh, it's a very nice feature of the model. Okay, how these uh, two thresholds uh, compare? Well, I'm going to, and this is something that I think is interesting that gives rise to a number of uh, <laughs> Sort of, uh, yeah, I will exploit this in the uh, discussion of the results. I'm going to call uh, a supervisor that uses the failing or likely to fail rule, uh, I1, uh, that is uh, described by the S hat, an F supervisor. And I'm going to uh, call a supervisor that uses the efficient liquidation rule as an E supervisor, efficient supervisor, right? Now, um, the uh, assumptions that I have uh, uh, presented allow me to compare S hat with S uh, star, and the difference is, is, is positive. So uh, there's a range of signals for which closure is inefficient. So the F supervisor is going to close the bank or send it to the resolution authority, and that will not be efficient, right? I'm, and I, this is pretty obvious because you're looking at the continuation return against the liability. You're not looking at the liquidation, whether you should or should not liquidate. That's for the resolution authority, as I will explain later. So the F supervisor is going to be tougher than the E supervisor. It's going to have a higher liquidation threshold. Now, so these are the questions that I would like to address with this setting. The first one is the first obvious one. Does supervision reduce bank risk taking? I mean, we show that regulation does, but supervision does it. If so, what are the channels for this effect? 
Next, is a lower noise or a higher quality of supervisory information conducive to lower risk taking? Is an F supervisor more effective in reducing risk taking than an E supervisor? And finally, how does supervision interact with regulation? So these are the questions that I would like to address with this, uh, with this setting. Okay. So um, something about the bank's objective function when you have a supervisor. I'm going to assume that the supervisor uses the liquidation process to cover deposit insurance payouts. So the bank gets zero payoff when uh, you have this uh, uh, S observation below S hat. Okay. So now we can analyze the bank's choice of risk. Again, you maximize the V function, which is the difference between the expected return given the closure rule minus the cost of its taking where the closure threshold is given by this uh, S hat that appears here. Now, um, you can uh, compute the bank's expected payoff at equals two. Now, you're conditioning on two things. Now, you, the, the bank uh, only gets R minus one, but only if uh, the final return is greater than or equal to the value of the liabilities, and you pass the supervisor's examination, the S greater than the S hat, right? So now, what you have here is uh, uh, a the proper expectation and of uh, truncated normal distributions, right? So that's, uh, now, um, uh, I, I didn't know anything about this when I started. So I, I went to see to my colleague, Manuel Arellano, who knows everything about uh, econometrics. And he referred me to an appendix in Madala's uh, book on limited dependent variables in econometrics, right? And in this appendix, you have all the formulas that you need to know here, but the interesting thing is that these uh, properties come from a paper that was published in 1961 by a guy called S. Rosenbaum, Moments of a Truncated Bivariate Normal Distribution. And this was published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. And the affiliation of this Rosenbaum was in the Army Medical Statistical Department of the British uh, Army. So anyway. <laughs> So, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a four-page paper uh, where you have all these uh, formulas. Anyway, so I use these uh, expressions to compute uh, the uh, expected payoff. Uh, it looks pretty horrible, but it could be, could be even worse. Uh, anyway, for, for that, it's a nice closed-form solution. It only involves the variables that I have introduced together with the density and the CDF of a normal distribution. And, uh, and then I can basically... Uh, um, just, uh, okay, well, something about the noise, right? Now, um, there are two limit cases that I would like to uh, study here. One is what happens if the precision, uh, sorry, the noise goes to zero? I mean, so so this basically in that case, the supervisor would get perfect information about what's going to happen in the future. If that's the case, then what uh, you, uh, this is actually not exactly, I mean, this was one of the typos in the slide. What happens is, is it's true that the probability that you're going to be below S hat is equal to the probability that, because basically your S hat tends to one, R tends to one, but what is more important is that basically the bank will be closed by the supervisor if and only if it would fail at T equals two. So basically, this is equivalent to less fair. I mean, basically you advance, uh, if there is no discounting, there is no difference between less fair and perfect supervisor information. If you go to the other extreme, when tau goes to infinity, basically, what this means is that the threshold goes to minus infinity. The probability that you're going to be below the threshold is zero. Again, this is uh, equivalent to less fair. So what this means is that uh, the relationship, uh, the interesting thing is what happens when tau is between zero and plus infinity. And, and what, uh, what I'm going to show is that supervision reduces the bank risk taking, but the relationship is not monotonic. So it starts at the less fair ends in the less fair. So in the middle, it goes down, right? So that's, that's what, uh, anyway, so this is the picture that shows the effect of uh, supervision. The uh, blue line uh, here uh, corresponds to less fair. The red line is the payoff under supervision. And you can see that these functions are pushed down and the sigma star goes to the left. So there is less risk taking with bank supervision, okay? Now, nothing about parameter values. I'm assuming that tau is equal to one. Um, and uh, so notice that since uh, the limit when tau tends to zero is equal to the limit when tau tends to infinity, the relationship between tau and sigma star of tau cannot be monotonic. It's going to be first decreasing and then increasing. So this is the picture that you have. So you start in the less fair when the 
tau is equal to zero, you end up for very high values of tau back in the let's say frame. Now, of course, tau here, I mean, 20 times uh, the uh, variance is a bit too much noise. So the relevant range is something that is close to the origin like that. So basically, over that range, you can see that the better the quality of the information, which is a lower value of tau, implies higher risk taking. So uh, going back to what uh, Claudia uh, said yesterday, limited resources uh, may actually be a blessing because that makes uh, the supervisor to make mistakes. And let me try to explain why mistakes may be actually good for banks risk taking. So in the relevant range, low tau, uh, uh, better quality of information increases banks risk taking. So, uh, okay, so how can this be explained? So let me try to sort of uh, put some pictures, uh, actually not very different from what Kartik you had before. So these are uh, on the horizontal axis, I have the final return of the bank. On the vertical axis, the noise. Now, there are two lines here. The uh, vertical R equals one is the default threshold uh, for the bank. And the blue line here is the closure threshold. Uh, remember that here is R plus uh, epsilon equals S hat. So it's a minus 45 degree line. S hat is to the left of one, so therefore this is corresponds to what I have presented. Now the two regions that I would like to stress uh, here is this is the failure region, which is sort of shaded in red. So to the left of the red line, the bank is going to default at t equals two. This is uh, the liquidation region, which you don't see very well, is sort of supposed to be a light blue. To the left of the blue line, the bank is going to be closed by the uh, supervisor at t equals one. So the key area that one should focus on is that area. This is an area where the bank is closed by the supervisor, but will have survived had it been allowed to continue until t equals one. So this is the reason why the bank is going to reduce risk taking because it wants to avoid to fall into that region. That's, that's the story in this, in this paper. So in this key region, the bank is liquidated at t equals one because the signal is bad, but it would not have failed at t equals two because r is greater than or equal to one. So what is the effect of this, uh, uh, of this thing? So, and, and moreover, the probability of falling into this region is always going to be positive. So now, but of course, this probability is going to be a function of the sigma. If you reduce sigma, then you reduce the probability that you fall into that region. And that's exactly what uh, happens. The disciplining effect of supervision comes from the fact that supervisory information is noisy. That's, that's the kind of shocking, maybe surprising thing. Okay, I will have something to say about that. Now, I, I, I then uh, discuss the effect of noise on risk taking. Uh, an increase in tau has two effects. It moves the boundary of the region to the left, uh, increases the variance of the uh, noise, and uh, the boundary to the left uh, is something that should be good because there is less likely that you fall there. But increasing the noise means that uh, even if it is a smaller region, there is a higher probability that you fall into that region. So uh, the first effect reduces, uh, uh, sorry, leads to an increase in sigma star, but the second effect increases, uh, reduces sigma star. So uh, for low values of tau, the second effect dominates. And so this explains why a lower quality of the supervisor information leads to lower risk taking. Okay, now let me compare the two types of supervisors to see what, uh, is an F supervisor using the failing or likely to fail rule more effective than an E supervisor using the efficient liquidation rule in controlling risk taking incentives? And the answer is yes. Why is this the case? Well, because by a previous result, the S had the threshold of the uh, F supervisor is higher than the threshold of the uh, E supervisor for the same. So the F supervisor is, is, is the blue line, the E supervisor is the green line, right? And so there is this difference. Uh, uh, the F supervisor is tougher, is going to close the bank in a bigger uh, set of, uh, for a bigger combination of values of epsilon and R, and that is what makes the uh, bank to be more conservative uh, in terms of risk taking, because you, have, you are facing a tougher supervisor for the same level of noise, right? So that's the idea. So um, the higher threshold of the F supervisor with no change in the variance of the noise leads the bank to choose a smaller sigma star, 
to reduce the probability of falling into this uh, key region. So that's the picture that uh, shows that, uh, well, this would be the uh, value of uh, risk taking uh, for the uh, efficient closure rule. That would be the value of risk taking for the uh, failing or likely to fail rule. And notice that the dashed red line is way above the uh, red line. So, so uh, having a tougher supervisor is actually good from the perspective of uh, risk taking incentives. Okay, so now, uh, Regulation and supervision. I want to spend some time in the discussion, so this, this I can do quickly. Now, what if we put together a supervisor in a context where the bank is subject to a capital requirement? So that's the question. What is the effect of introducing an F supervisor in a setup where the bank is subject to a capital requirement? So uh, the closure rule obviously has to be modified because now the bank is failing or likely to fail when this expected value is smaller than the uh, liabilities, which is one minus K bar. Now, now you, have, you have this uh, capital buffer that uh, can take care of some. So what this means is that the threshold is going to be decreasing in the capital requirement. So that's, that's the, uh, the kind of thing that uh, appears here. Still, uh, you can write uh, the expression for the expected payoff when the S hat, this is the F supervisor with K bar, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a mess uh, here. Still, uh, you have this uh, uh, closed form solution for that uh, expression, and then you can uh, uh, analyze what is the effect of, uh, for any value of K bar of adding uh, supervision with a particular uh, noise. So, so the bank's choice of risk, I'm going to, uh, is going to depend on the, uh, noise of the supervisor, the uh, capital requirement, and well, I mean, uh, what I'm going to plot uh, is the value of sigma star, the uh, bank's choice of risk, for a range of values of k bar and two values of tau. Tau equals infinity, which would be the less fair, and tau equals one. And so this is the picture. Now the top one is what I had before with uh, capital regulation, the green line, no supervision, right? And the red line uh, is what happens if on top of uh, this capital requirement that appears in the horizontal axis, you add the closure rule of an F supervisor. And notice that the effect of supervision is actually very significant and it is increasing in the capital requirement. So, so the higher the capital requirement, the more effective supervision is going to be in reducing banks' risk-taking incentives. So, um, so the, we can also do the probability of uh, bank failure, which is the probability that you are either failing at t equals two or you are close at t equals one for a range of values of k. And again, the two values, the laissez faire and uh, tau equals one. And you can see that, uh, well, again, this is the almost linear function, the green line that we had before. And the red line shows that, in fact, supervision is very effective. And, I mean, I, I said that you should only look at qualitative results, but look at that. I mean, basically the combination of a capital requirement of between 15 and 20% and a supervision with this type of noise almost gets the bank to safety, right? The probability of failure is almost zero. I mean, don't, I don't want to make, I mean, this is just a, a numerical exercise, but again, I mean, I, I was pretty struck by the fact that it seems to be extremely powerful, the combination of regulation and supervision here. Okay, right, so summing up, regulation and supervision are complements. Supervision is more effective for high capital requirements. And uh, now uh, I have some time to uh, discuss some of these results, and I hope that you find the discussion uh, uh, interesting now that I've done all the hard work. Now, <clears throat> I want to comment on three features of the model with bank supervision. Now, the first is something to do with the beneficial effects of having a tough supervisor. The second uh, comment that I want to make is something about the noisy supervisor information, something that uh, I was surprised to find, but uh, um, you may be surprised to find. And then the third one has to do with, uh, uh, with uh, resolution, right? Uh, okay, now, first effect. Now, um, the... Uh, Beneficial effects of having a tough supervisor remind me 
of the old literature on central bank independence. So, Vitor, you probably something that uh, this is something that you're going to like. I mean, you know that the delegation of monetary policy to an agent with preferences biased towards price stability delivers outcomes which are better in terms of employment and inflation. So, what we have here is that delegation of supervision to an agent with preferences biased towards closure, this is the F supervisor, actually deliver better outcomes in terms of risk taking. So this, is, this seems like a, an interesting result. Notice that uh, the F supervisor is tougher than the E supervisor. So having someone tougher than what would be efficient uh, is something that is good from the perspective of uh, risk taking. The second is the noise thing. Now, it may be surprising that higher noise in a relevant range leads to lower risk taking. But uh, I was seen at a conference at the LSE uh, last week, and Amit Seru was there. And he mentioned a paper, recent paper of his, which appeared in the SSRN in April of this year. And in this paper, uh, whose title is Noisy Experts, uh, he has this result that says, I mean, this is a quotation from the paper. Some amount of uncertainty around bank supervisory models, such as stress tests, may be desirable in that it could limit opportunistic gaming by banks and encourage conservative actions. So this is an empirical uh, sort of test of what the model, and which I discovered only last week, and it seems that there may be something there worth uh, studying more, uh, uh, more deeply. Finally, um, this uh, closure need not imply liquidation. Now, uh, if you use the failing or likely to fail rule, uh, then uh, you don't have to think about this as the liquidation of the bank in terms of uh, getting the L instead of the R. Because uh, you could think of this as the transfer to another authority like the single resolution board that would decide between resolution and liquidation. So in particular, resolution could be applied when the expected continuation return is higher than the expected liquidation return. So th therefore, um, banks uh, would not be inefficiently liquidated, uh, but of course the management would be fired and that would be key for risk taking incentives. So what, what, what this discussion brings to the fore is that uh, the institutional setting that we have in Europe where you have an SSM uh, looking at failing or likely to fail and then transferring this to uh, a resolution authority that looks at what would be best way of dealing with this, uh, with this failing bank is actually very good from the point of view of risk taking incentives because you have the tough supervisor taking decisions which are going to imply lower risk taking and then you have the other authority that is going to look at what's the best way to deal with this uh, failing bank. So that's uh, uh, an unexpected uh, result that uh, comes from this uh, research. Okay, so um, let me uh, conclude and uh, maybe leave uh, a few minutes for uh, questions or comments. Now, um, <clears throat> I want to sort of go back to uh, what uh, bank supervision is about, and I'm, I'm a bit uh, hesitant to say this in front of this audience, but anyway, I mean, uh, Assess bank supervision involves, first of all, assessment of compliance with regulation, assessment of liquidity, solvency, governance, through monitoring, and use of this information to request corrective actions. Now, what I've done in this paper is focusing on the second and third tasks. Uh, but the first one is crucial because regulation, as I have shown, has large effects on risk taking, but only if it is properly enforced. I mean, if, so you have regulation that is not enforced and banks are manipulating risk weights and doing all kinds of things, then of course the regulation, the effects of regulation are not going to be what uh, one would uh, uh, expect. So this is my first uh, remark that, uh, that there is another role of supervision that I have not uh, discussed in this model. The second remark has to do with welfare. Now, I am uh, writing a paper on the positive effects of regulation and supervision on bank risk taking, but what about welfare? Now, here, I would like to bring uh, two, well, actually three issues to the uh, front. Liquidation may be efficient, but the bank may prefer to gamble for resurrection. So having a supervisor that looks at signals uh, and uh, decides on the early closure is actually efficient because you're going to get the, 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 the red line, as opposed, sort of the, 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 you know, these two uh, graphs that I had before. So this is, a, this is a good thing from a social uh, welfare perspective. Secondly, uh, lower risk taking, uh, remember that in my setup, 
the expected return of the investments uh, is constant. It's the R bar or the AR bar. But of course, I mean, so, so in principle, we shouldn't care about risk. Uh, but uh, to the extent that uh, uh, I'm assuming uh, insured deposits, uh, if deposit insurance payouts are funded with distortionary taxation, then this is something to worry about uh, in terms of risk taking. Lowering uh, risk taking is going to reduce deposit insurance payouts, and this is something that is going to be good uh, from a social welfare perspective. And, but the flip side, and we should not forget this, is that both regulation and supervision are costly. Uh, regulation imposes, uh, if we don't believe in Modigliani Miller, cost to the funding of banks, and supervision is costly, as uh, you know here, that uh, this is something that uh, is costly in terms of uh, uh, paying for the supervisors, is costly in terms of the compliance by the uh, uh, banks, and therefore, uh, if you want to make a welfare assessment, then this is something that uh, you should uh, uh, also consider. So I guess that this is all I have to say. Uh, thank you for your attention, and let me just conclude with a final slide. Happy 10th anniversary, uh, SSM. Very good. Okay. Floor is open for questions. Um, that's a really lovely model in beautiful equations. Um, so I have sort of a, a couple of sort of questions. There's some recent work on the lender of last resort that sort of argued that uh, it actually is beneficial for supervisors who want to collect information. They get noisy information about failure likely to fail. And the lender of last resort allows it to collect more and more precise information. And that's sort of good. Would then your results sort of kind of speak to the be the opposite of this, that a lender of last resort might reduce the effectiveness of a supervisor? Well, I mean, okay, uh, I mean, I, I, I would like to think about how to fit what you're saying into this uh, perspective. But I think that, I mean, the idea would be, I'm mean, just thinking uh, aloud, that um, why would a lender of last resort be acting in a context like this? Well, maybe because not just the supervisors, but uh, the private sector uh, depositors get some information about the bank and they act on that information by withdrawing funds from the bank. Now, if the bank access the uh, lender of last resort, then obviously this is a, an additional information that may be useful from the perspective of uh, looking at the prospects of the bank. So I think that that information uh, is certainly valuable, should be incorporated into the supervisory information. I think that that will be the quick uh, answer to your question. Uh, very quick, do you have a sense of what would be optimal supervisory rules. So here you focus on one particular one, but what would be a socially optimal rule, or can one generate a social? Well, you, you would have to first write the social welfare function, right? Uh, you will have to include a cost of uh, supervisory uh, precision, right? Because, I mean, uh, and this cost actually may be convex because uh, uh, getting to perfection may be actually very, very costly. I mean, you may have to have as many people in the bank uh, working on risk uh, as, as, as uh, supervisors as people working on the bank. So I don't know. I mean, uh, but I think that that would be the way to, to, to go about. And, uh, but, but remember, this is just a model, right? So uh, it, it's not going to tell you uh, the number of staff that you need to have here. I don't know. I mean, this is... Uh, Question on this side? Yes, please. Hi, um, two questions. So the first one was... Do, do, Dominique was my PhD student, so you better be So, behave. Okay. so <laughs> Dominique, because of that, you can ask to everyone else, one from now on. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first question is about this complementarity between supervision and, uh, and regulation. And you showed that basically for sufficiently high levels of regulation, there seems to be this amplification effect. And I was wondering if you can shed a bit more insight on why there is this amplification. And the second question is about the cost that you highlighted in the end. So could you, in the context of your model, talk a bit about um, how to uh, how to evaluate uh, the cost of regulation versus supervision in terms of achieving a given amount of risk reduction? Okay, uh, let me start with the second. I, I, I was planning to do a, 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 a 
graph in which you have the K bar and the tau and, and see this, this kind of uh, equal risk for different parameters, but I, I didn't have time to do it. I mean, it's doable. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that this is a, a very interesting uh, picture. What I think is interesting is your first question. Why is it that you have this sort of amplification effect of supervision when you have cap high capital requirements? I'm not sure I can give you an answer to that. Uh, after all, I finished writing this thing last week, so that's... Uh, but my sense is that what happens is that you're moving in the tails of the distribution, right? If you're moving in the tails of the distribution, any small change in the sigma is going to have a big effect on the amount, on, on the probabilities of, of, uh, of, of failure. So that's why you get to almost zero, because basically you are almost to a, to a point in which the, 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 the normal distribution is basically equal to zero. So that's what I, uh, that's my sense, but I, uh, I, have to, I have to do the homework. Thank you. So, I mean, really great paper, congratulations. I mean, one thing I was thinking throughout the, the, the presentation is who, who, I mean, what is the empirical counterpart of the two supervisors that you, that you have in the model? And, and indeed, thinking about the, the peer supervisor versus the resolution authority may, makes a lot of sense. But the question is, I mean, so, so indeed these two authorities have different incentives and they can think about liquidation in different terms, but they also have different tools and the supervisor can act much earlier than the resolution authority and, and can have powers to kind of deal with risk taking in, in a much earlier period. So I wonder, I mean, how would this work in the model if they can act in different times and with different tools? I mean, it, it's very clear that there is a, there's a clear timing. I mean, first, uh, there is the information collected by supervision then there is the decision of the supervisor, and then in a second stage, if you think that my uh, proposed interpretation, then would be the resolution authority that takes care of the sort of liquidation versus uh, uh, resolution as, as, as uh, comparing uh, the possible outcomes of one and the other. So I think it's, it's very clearly, I mean, one issue that, I mean, the resolution authority should have some information, otherwise how is it going to do it uh, overnight or, or a weekend. So that's, that's the other thing, but I'm not uh, sort of uh, commenting on that. Yeah, uh, beautiful model and uh, similar to you, I'm here. Yeah, okay. Uh, similar to you, I find this result that you have on the effect of the supervisory noise on the restaking, I think this is super interesting and novel. Uh, so I'm trying to think about the supervisory expertise, that seems to be kind of one of the probably uh, also uh, current local agenda to invest in, thinking about um, um, when you have uh, a supervisor who uh, is gaining more expertise, he will probably on average will be tougher because he is also, you know, now has more information based on what he will make a decision. But on the other hand, investing in supervisory expertise may actually negatively affect the amount of the noise out there. So I'm just I'm just trying to uh, to to think about this myself and will be happy to. Uh, well, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I think that to to me this result was a bit surprising when I when I got it and I was very pleased to see uh, the uh, Amit Serus uh, paper, uh, but I, I think uh, this is something that deserves to be uh, analyzed. I, I think that one important consideration is when you look at the extremes tau equals zero, tau is infinity, you get laissez-faire. For different reasons, but you get laissez-faire. So the question is, how is the shape that happens in the middle? And it's not very surprising that uh, there is some disciplining effect that happens in the middle. So the question is, what, I mean, is it a nice sort of uh, concave curve or is it something, I, I don't know why you get that. Probably it is model dependent. Uh, if you have, instead of having this, uh, normal uh, setup, you have other types of uh, uh, probability distributions, then maybe things would be different. But uh, at, at this point, I, I don't know. But I, it seems reasonable, if you look at the extremes, that you're going to get less effort at the extremes, and then uh, some noise is likely to have a positive effect. Yeah. Last question. Thanks a lot, a very interesting paper. Um, one question, could your model also speak to the debate about uh, rules-based versus more discretionary 
supervision. So well, you may the, 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 this, this, this. Uh, I mean, again, the Cedros paper is very clear on that. Discretion is good. Discretion introduces noise, and that's uh, good for uh, risk-taking incentives. So, you, I mean, the, I mean, I, I haven't read carefully their paper, but they look at the camels' ratings and they look at the M. Uh, which is the most discretionary part of that. And M is important, and that's what brings the uh, beneficial effects of, uh, of, 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 uh, of supervision. Just have a round of applause for the great keynote by Rafa.